This is an RNZ podcast. Kia ora, for William Rayaho. Welcome to Black Sheep. This week, John Bryce, farmer, soldier, politician. To his supporters in his day, he was a champion of the New Zealand pioneer spirit. A self-made man who dragged himself up by the bootstraps to become one of the leading men in 1800s New Zealand. The settlers in Taranaki had a nickname for him, Honest John. Taranaki Māori had a different nickname. They called him Bryce Kohuru, Bryce the Murderer. So as far as, as, as Taranaki Māori are concerned, he's cast as the villain who, who burnt down the houses, uh, who caused hardship to the people, uh, and who led the army on his white horse. Even the fact of riding a white horse up the road to Parihaka, you know, just, just really sets all these visions of, of an a ego-driven man who wants to be seen as the hero, who wants to be seen as the saviour uh, at, the, at the head of a, a conquering army. This is Dennis Nafare. He's a member of the wider Parihaka community and an opinion writer for the Taranaki Daily News. He also has a doctorate in philosophy. So my, my title is Dr. Nafare, mm-hmm. <laughs> Dr. Dennis Nafare, or my, uh, my, um, my MC name is Dr. Soulcake, but I don't suppose <laughs> you want to use that in this line. Well, we'll definitely go with Dr. Soulcake then. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to Dr. Nafare, a.k.a. Dr. Soulcake, a bit later on, but first I'll introduce you to Moira Cook, a historian who wrote a short biography of John Bryce, starting from his very earliest years in Scotland. Yes, he was born in 1834, um, and his mother died in 1839, and his father brought him, a young John and his brother Thomas and his elder sister Jeanette, out to New Zealand, taking advantage of the first New Zealand company ship to leave from Scotland. John Bryce has gone down in history as an arrogant, sometimes brutal man with harsh attitudes towards Māori even for his time. But the weird thing is, when you look at his early life, you can kind of understand how he got that way. The earliest hint comes when he was just six years old in 1839, waiting for that New Zealand company ship to set sail from Scotland. A poem written by the Scottish poet laureate Robert Southey was read to the passengers. And I'll just read a little bit of it to you. On Zealand's hills where tigers steal along, and the dread Indian chants a dismal song, where human fiends on midnight errands walk and bathe in brains the murderous tomahawk. That's not very encouraging. And that fear can only have deepened when he heard the other passengers and crew telling stories of the Boyd Massacre 30 years earlier, when more than 60 Europeans were killed and eaten in Whangaroa Harbour. And when John and his family landed New Zealand, near Patone, his early experiences didn't do much to dispel that fear. There was a large pa with about 300 armed Māori next to them in Patoni, and they were reliant on Māori for labour and for some of their foods. But remembering the warning they'd received, they lived in some apprehension. They were sort of living under the protection of, of this pa to a degree. That's right, of Puakawa, who was the, the Māori chief of that particular pa. And very shortly after their arrival, there's a raid on, on that group of Māori. Māori from, from the Kapiti Coast, Te Rapraha and Rangihatia, came down and Puakwa was actually killed. And um, I would think this again would have had an impression on a six-year-old. John Bryce had another foundational experience with Māori when he reached his teens. 1846 was the first time he witnessed direct conflict between Māori and Pākehā. These days it's known as the Hutt War and it was fuelled by some really dodgy deal-making by the New Zealand company which led to a lot of friction over what land belonged to Māori and what belonged to the settlers. And one very famous story from this time concerned a young British volunteer, a young bugler for for the regiment and the troops had been warned that there could be a raid but nothing was done about it. 
And when the raid started first thing in the morning, Bugler Allen sounded the alarm. This heroic story of Bugler William Allen became part of the mythology of early settler New Zealand. Here's how it was told in Lewis Ward's book, Early Wellington. During the fighting at Bulcart's farm, the hut, on the 16th of May, 1846, a bugler named Allen, belonging to the 58th Regiment, espied a body of rebels coming stealthily forward to attack the detachment of troops stationed there. He was in the act of sounding an alarm on the bugle to give warning to the regiment when he was struck by a tomahawk on his right arm. He placed the bugle in his left hand when that limb was also struck. Then, placing the bugle between his knees, he effected his purpose, but was instantly brained with a tomahawk. His heroic act saved the whole detachment from being massacred. And this became part of the colony's folklore. He was lauded as as a hero. And it must have made a lasting impression on Bryce, because he told the story over 50 years later to Sir James Wilson, who included it in his book, Early Rangitiki. I mean, it it seems sort of obvious to assume that these sort of early interactions and early life experiences are part of what informed his later attitude towards Māori. I think they probably did, and that obviously made an impression because, as I say, 50 years later, he was still still fresh in his mind. A few years after the Hutt War, John and his older brother left for Australia to become diggers in the Victorian gold rush. They must have done pretty well because when John came back to New Zealand in 1852, he had enough money to buy land near Whanganui, a place called Brunswick, where he farmed for the next 50 years. He married, started a family, got involved in local politics and seems to have become an important figure in the community. But it wasn't exactly the safest place to live. The 1860s saw the outbreak of the Taranaki Wars, which we talked a bit about in our previous episode on Kimball Bent. Again, these wars were fuelled mostly by the desire of the government to get hold of Māori land so it could be sold to settlers. It got very close to um, to Whanganui and certainly through the Kaiwi district. Um, a lot of settlers had their houses set on fire. Bryce's small cottage was burnt to the ground. He couldn't prove whether it was an accident or whether it had been done deliberately. This led to the country people getting together to discuss how they could protect their families and protect their property. And this resulted in the formation of the Kaiwi Cavalry in 1868. Just to give a bit more of an explanation, the Kaiwi Cavalry were one of a number of volunteer units which operated alongside the professional British Army. They didn't have much in the way of training or military discipline. They were basically just a militia of self-equipped farmers. That said, the cavalry volunteers were very important for the government side of the war. Because so many of its members, besides being reliable men, are so intimately acquainted with the country. And one of the newspapers said it was made clear by the dread the Māori's head of the Wanganui and Kaiwi cavalry that they were an important part of that war. John Bryce was chosen to lead the Kaiwi Cavalry, partly because he'd previously served in the army earlier on in the Taranaki Wars, and also probably partly because of his significant position in the community. But he seems to have been either unable or maybe unwilling to fully control his troops. This letter from Bryce's commander probably describes the Kaiwi Cavalry better than I could. A motley group of horsemen from 14 to 60 years of age, a perfect pack of devils and most uncontrollable. If they smell natives, they follow Bryce like a pack of hounds and cut, slay and destroy the poor natives before you have time to look around you. As that letter suggests, the Kairi cavalry had a problem with discipline and they also had a problem with Māori. There was one incident where they were on patrol in the Patia district during the campaign against Titukawaru. Bryce and his troops were ordered to form up behind a group of Māori who were fighting on the government side. The troops refused to follow the, um, the Māori troops. They made a comment that they were there to get Titukawaru and they weren't going to be led by people of his race, or to that effect. <laughs> 
The most infamous incident involving the Kaiwi Cavalry happened after their very first mission. They were accompanying the Mounted Constabulary, which was a, a regular unit. They saw a party of Māori near a woolshed. Sub-Inspector Newland, who was in charge of the regular unit, um, gave the order to charge. But as they got closer to this group of Māori, they could see these weren't warriors. It was a group of young, unarmed boys. However, the cavalry continued with their pursuit while the officers tried desperately to regain control of them. This is another incident of their insubordination. Bryce eventually caught up with his men. He got ahead of Maxwell, who was leading the, the cavalry charge, and ordered him and the rest of the men to retire. But Bryce's men refused to listen. They continued riding after the children, who were running for their lives. Bryce then drew his sword and was quoted as saying, the first man who passes me, I will cut him down. So he did try to stop it, but the whole thing was, was should never have happened. Bryce couldn't stop his men. A report which was written after this incident by the officer who ordered the charge boasted that eight members of a marauding party of rebels were killed. A Nati Roda chief, Urutu Angina, gave a different and probably much more accurate account of the casualties a few years later. Two were killed on the spot, and several more or less wounded. One lad, about ten years old, was killed by a stroke from a sword that cut his head in two halves. Another lad, about twelve years old, was killed by many strokes of a sword and was much cut about and shot with carbines. Neither of these lads had arrived at the age of puberty. As Moira Cook pointed out, Bryce tried to stop this attack, but it's hard to cut him too much slack. As the commander of the Kaiwi Cavalry, he was responsible for his men's conduct. The buck stopped with him. These killings earned John Bryce his nickname among Māori, Bryce Kohuru, Bryce the Murderer. After the wars in Taranaki ended, the Kaiwi cavalry were disbanded. This was partly because the men in that unit, Bryce included, were making demands which the government of Premier William Fox found unacceptable. They were trying to get assurances from the government that Māori would be excluded from the district. Fox refused this and later demobilised all volunteer groups describing them as raggle-taggled soldiery. And he stopped their pay, after which Bryce recommended the disbandment of his corps rather than have it suffer a lingering death. Yes, he made a very emotional uh, speech to his troops, praising them for their, the work that they had done and saying that this would always be a very important part of his life. But he felt he had been let down by the government. They had been um, disregarded for what they had done. I mean, I don't know whether it's a response to this or whether it's just him getting back to what he'd been doing before the war, but he gets much more involved in politics. He was he was elected to the Wellington Provincial Council and he continued his campaign for separation. He was not in favour of central government from Wellington. And he, he certainly advocated for local government, which is what, what, where he had started and what he was involved in. And this might have been why he had such a um, hostile relationship <laughs> with many of the other politicians when he eventually did enter um, national politics. John Bryce was the sort of man who made not very many friends, but the friends he had were, were good, strong friends. But he did antagonise a lot of people. As a politician, John Bryce was outspoken and extremely stubborn. He reacted furiously when he didn't get his way. Over the course of his career, he resigned in protest multiple times rather than back down. He, he could see what, what he felt 
should be done and went the direct way to do it. He had no finesse, he had uh, no subtlety about him at all. But while he was at loggerheads with the political establishment over the question of local versus national rule of New Zealand, he had another political platform where he found much more support. He was a great advocate of settlement. I think he, like a lot of new New Zealanders, were afraid that there would be war again. And this was one of his solutions towards it. And what did he mean when he sort of was talking about settlement? We're looking at it through a 19th century lens when Europeans, most Europeans, felt that they were superior to the natives, in inverted commas. And he probably just took that one step further forward and felt that if there was areas which were settled, which were farmed um, by European standards, yeah, it would have meant taking some Māori land or confiscated land, that this would give much more stability to New Zealand. So it was sort of like if you had sort of European-run villages and farms sort of all across New Zealand, that Māori would sort of eventually come around and sort of feel like that was a, that was for the best. I think that was Bryce's, Bryce's feeling. Certainly he was a great advocate for settlement, as he called it. This advocacy helped John Bryce win the votes he needed to enter national politics and to win allies in the political establishment. In 1879, he was made the Minister of Native Affairs. He inherited a native department which was tainted by allegations of overspending, mismanagement and corruption. Donald Maclean had promoted a system of personal government and the department was, in inverted commas, a hotbed of corruption and patronage. And when it came to the reorganisation of the department, he put his reputation and position on the line and over time achieved a saving of nearly 50% without compromising its performance. And it was reported that Māori themselves supported his reforms. I want to be careful we don't overstate John Bryce's performance as Native Affairs Minister because, as we were about to hear, he was involved in some really terrible stuff. But one way he was an improvement on earlier ministers is that he wasn't in thrall to the land speculators in Auckland, which meant he was less corrupt than some of his predecessors. That said, by far the biggest legacy of Bryce's tenure as Native Affairs Minister was at Parihaka. By the late 1870s, there was huge demand for settler land. Vogel had been the agent general in London, and he had promoted New Zealand, so a lot of settlers had arrived or were arriving. The Grey government was uh, short of funds, so they determined to open up the Waimati Plains for sale. And this posed a threat to the existence of Parihaka. By the time Bryce became the Native Affairs Minister, Parihaka was the largest Māori settlement in New Zealand. Thousands of people lived there, and its people were engaged in a non-violent campaign to resist settlement of confiscated land near the village. Bryce was determined to do something about this. The West Coast was what he called a festering sore, and whereas Gray and Sheehan had been content at times to apply a, a salve and sticking plasters to problems as they developed, Bryce made it plain that the only remedy he saw was to cauterise the wound, was to, to deal with it once and for all. The first remedy Bryce tried was getting much tougher on the people who were involved in non-violent resistance. Hundreds were locked up and held without trial. Here's Dr Dennis Nafare again. Notwithstanding the fact that these people were being arrested, uh, even though they weren't causing harm to anyone, um, they were just maintaining their rights to their traditional lands as as they saw fit. and you know, John Bryce has definitely been the architect of a lot of those bills that were getting passed at the time. I mean, it's amazing because John Bryce himself says in Parliament that if these people did face trial, they'd likely probably not get more than a day in prison as as punishment. And then he goes ahead and, and proposes a bill saying that these people don't get a trial at all. I mean, basically, they're locked up forever. Mm. Exactly, and and originally it was at the governor's pleasure, and then just bill after bill over the years following, just delaying and extending these these prison terms uh, for those people who were arrested, uh, 
And the the thing in Taranaki was that it was the rangatira or, or the chiefs of their people who were walking into imprisonment first. And one one of those imprisoned, uh, Burimu Kingi Te Matakatia, uh, who was considered one of the, the, the primary leaders of, of Taranaki iwi at the time, um, he was offered his freedom, but he refused. As long as his people continued to be imprisoned, he would stay in captivity with them. This plan of indefinitely detaining non-violent protesters failed. All through 1879 and 1880, there was a sort of agricultural warfare. The Europeans would knock down a fence to build a road which would allow settlers' livestock to destroy Māori crops. Then Māori would come back and build a new fence across the road and plough up the settlers' grazing pasture. John Bryce was furious with the situation. He advised, quote, direct action against the leaders of Parihaka, and when this was refused, he resigned in protest, although he was later reinstated. Eventually, on November 5th, 1881, he got his chance. The government sent Bryce to lead 1,600 men to Parihaka. On his white charger, with 595 volunteers and 630 armed constabulary, so a, a group of armed um, police advanced on Parihaka to be met by children singing and doing poi dances. Of course, these days Parihaka is famous as one of the world's very first major campaigns of non-violent resistance. But this clearly isn't what John Bryce and his soldiers were expecting. They were expecting to have to fight. There were a lot of soldiers who re-enlisted as part of the armed constabulary. And you know, a lot of those who had perhaps fought during the land wars, who had heard stories you know, who were related to people who'd fought, and, and they'd really talked up the menace of, of what was waiting for them at Parihaka, and they went with guns loaded. I mean, there were artillery posted pointing at this town as if they were afraid that there was going to be war break out then and there. I, I, I have no doubt that if any act of violence had been offered by the people, uh, whether forced or unforced, um, that there could have been a massacre. Um, so on one hand, it was the, the strength of will and strength of purpose of the people who had gathered there, uh, and and perhaps also that forbearance from the officers and the armed constabulary who refused to, who didn't give that order to fire. Um, but, you know, it was one of those situations that could have turned out really bad. There was no massacre at Parihaka. The leaders of the town were arrested and taken away without violence. But in the following days and weeks, that village, the largest Māori settlement in New Zealand, was destroyed. There were several thousand people gathered on the Marae Atea, including a large contingent from Wanganui, from Waikato, from the King Country, and the people refused to disperse. Uh, and so at the start, they had to try and identify people who weren't from Taranaki and then start moving them on. Um, then that led to the, the pulling down of, of houses and as well as the destruction of the cultivations uh, in order to force people to move. Uh, and that was under Bryce's orders too, to destroy all the cultivations that were there, uh, which then led to a point of near starvation of the people when they had nothing to eat and the weather closed in later on that year. While all this was going on, the troops under Bryce's command were stealing greenstone and other treasures from Māori homes, as well as committing much more serious crimes. Because the armed constabulary were also based full-time in Parihaka itself, they built a fort called Fort Rolleston, Uh, It wasn't long before those soldiers started molesting women. John Bryce ordered the destruction of homes and cultivation at Parihaka, but Maura Cook says it's less clear whether he knew about the looting and sexual assault which happened in the village. He was certainly there all the time. Um, One of the soldiers present said they were ordered not to touch any Māori property, but, and these are his words, we found the latter order too difficult to obey and there was looting of Māori artefacts. And a Waitangi tribunal report found that there is evidence that women were raped and otherwise molested. Bryce wouldn't have sanctioned it. I don't know how closely he could monitor it, but yes, he was ultimately responsible, I guess. Bryce never backed down from his actions at Parihaka, not once. 
Until his death, he maintained the raid was the right thing to do. Decades later, in his retirement, he was writing letters saying the leaders of the village were religious fanatics and that the pacifist resistance would eventually have grown into a bloody war had it not been nipped in the bud. And you can kind of see why he'd think that way. From his perspective, John Bryce had seen this pattern before during Titukawaru's war. Initially, the Ngāti Ruahine chief Titukawaru had preached peace. He named 1867 the Year of the Lamb and encouraged non-violent resistance. But then, in 1868, the tension over land confiscations became too much. War broke out and Titukawaru led a military campaign in which several of John Bryce's close friends were killed. Now, at Parihaka, Bryce was afraid the same thing could happen. After all, Titukawaru was one of the leaders at Parihaka. He participated in that war and in that struggle against Titukawaru and, and I certainly believe that that contributed towards his approach 10 years later at, at Parihaka that he saw that there was, was you know, the people that were involved, Te Tokowaru, Te Whetu Moyuhu, and other uh, leaders of, warrior leaders, um, that the only outcome would be war again. And so to snap the bow of the tree, um, best to invade to sort it out now. Aside from Parihaka, John Bryce's other big challenge as Native Affairs Minister was negotiating with the Kingitanga movement over the construction of a railway through the King Country. That whole saga is probably too long and complicated for this podcast, but in short, it was more of Bryce being arrogant and stubborn and getting into disagreements with Māori and Pākehā alike. At one point, the settlers in Napier burned an effigy of him for agreeing to pardon the guerrilla leader and prophet Te Koti in exchange for the support of a prominent chief in Waikato. John Bryce took a break from all the wrangling over Waikato in 1883 to deal with something which had made him even more furious than usual. It was a passage in a book called History of New Zealand by Australian author George Rusden. In that book, George Rusden was highly critical of how the colonial government had treated Māori in New Zealand, and one of the incidents it cited was that infamous charge of the Kaiwi cavalry against unarmed Māori. Some women and young children emerged from a pa to hunt pigs. Lieutenant Bryce and Sergeant Maxwell of the Kaiwi cavalry dashed upon them and cut them down gleefully and with ease. And it was factually incorrect in that there were no women there, but it didn't really excuse the cutting down of the children. Rumsden had been given this information by Bishop Hadfield, Archbishop Hadfield, and Governor Gordon, both of whom had had dealings with Bryce and both of whom were very antagonistic towards Bryce. Bryce, with the support of a lot of his colleagues decided to take personal legal action against Rumsden, which was quite courageous. He wasn't a wealthy man. He was a serious asthmatic and suffered considerable ill health. But as so often in the past, protecting his reputation was a priority. This whole court case seems pretty ridiculous to modernise. For one thing, only two copies of George Rusden's book were actually sold in New Zealand, although extracts were printed in the newspapers. But it provoked a furious reaction from editors, politicians and former soldiers. Just to give a taste, here's what a review in the Taranaki Herald had to say about Rusden. He never has a good word to say for a European. The history is one long indictment of every act of the local government. No doubt Mr Rusden is, in some instances, in the right. The superior intelligence of the Pākehā has more than once enabled him to take advantage of the lower development of the Māori. Interestingly, the politicians who were criticised in this book didn't seem particularly concerned about what people in New Zealand would think, but they were extremely worried about how it would be received in the UK. John Bryce himself said this. The slanders in the book may be laughed at in Wellington, Auckland or Dunedin, also in Melbourne and Sydney, but they are not laughed at in London, where the book is probably a successful deception. <laughs> 
And so, with the backing of his colleagues in government, John Bryce went to London, sued George Rusden for libel, and won. He came back home to a hero's welcome in New Zealand. The New Zealand Herald put it like this. The general satisfaction with which the news of the verdict in Bryce versus Rusden has been received throughout the colony marks not only the pleasure caused on learning of the vindication of one of our most prominent politicians and leading colonists, but also, in stronger degree, the sense that in thus clearing himself of the foul aspersions of Mr Rusden, Mr Bryce has also vindicated the public character of the colony at large. He returned to a succession of banquets and illuminated addresses. But they didn't really do him any favours with his electorate because he lost the next election. for the He'd won five in a row and he lost the next election in Waitotara because his electorate felt that they'd been neglected while he pursued his own interests. Which I guess is a fair point. I mean, I think we'd take a pretty dim view of it today if sort of an M- if an electorate MP sort of swanned off to the UK for many months That's right. doing a personal defamation case. <laughs> yes. <laughs> From this point on, John Bryce's political career seemed to stall. He continued to get involved in furious fights with his political rivals, including one case where he accused an opponent of electoral crimes. He took the case to court, lost, and was forced to pay £1,200 in damages. But his final fall from grace happened on the 27th of August, 1891, when he was serving as the leader of the opposition. There was a big debate going on in the House over accusations of corruption made by the Minister of Lands. The Premier, John Balance, tried to shut down the debate using some weird technicality, and Bryce stood up to object. The Premier should be ashamed of himself! There was such an uproar he couldn't complete the sentence. Balance demanded he withdrew his words. Bryce refused and left the chamber. And despite compromises and pleas offered by both sides of Parliament, his pride and his obstinacy would not allow him to return, while the vote of censure was still recorded against him. It's sort of... The whole thing just seems very... Both sort of very silly and procedural and also very immature in a, in a certain way. It encapsulates so many of the characteristics which made him the man he was. His single-mindedness, his stubbornness, his arrogance, a fierce and protectiveness of his reputation, also courage, honesty and a determination to hold to his own principles whatever the consequences. These qualities allowed him some successes in his life, but the same qualities also limited his political advancement. And he never returns to Parliament. He basically resigns after this yep. point. Yep, he's, he's, he's resigned. He's left Parliament. That's the end of his parliamentary life, his 30 years of parliamentary life. He lived for another 22 years in retirement. He continued farming at Brunswick until 1902 when he and his wife moved into Whanganui. Um, he enjoyed playing chess and lawn bowls and was able to spend time with his large family. He had 14 children and by then a lot of grandchildren. And he eventually died in 1913? 1913 he died, yes, he had a stroke and Black Sheep is written and presented by me, William Ray. The executive producer is Tim Watkin. Our sound engineer was Phil Benge. We had voice acting help from Simon Dickinson and Duncan Smith, as well as Colin Peacock from Media Watch. Speaking of Media Watch, why not add that to your podcast subscription list? To subscribe, just go to rnz.co.nz, click Podcast and Series and search for whichever show you're after. You can also use RNZ's app or whatever other podcasting app you prefer. Also, if you have a second, please leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. That's probably the biggest thing you could do for us. It really helps new people find this show. And finally, thanks for listening. This is the end of Season 3, but with any luck, we'll be back for a fourth. Hopefully, we'll finally get around to the story of Minnie Dean, which has been much requested from all of you out there. By the way, if you have any other um, Black Sheep suggestions or comments, you can email me. My address is william.ray, that's spelled R-A-Y, at radionz.co.nz. Kakite. Ka
holiday gatherings are happening. Stack on the sparkle this season with unforgettable jewelry from Blue Nile. Right now, save up to 50% site-wide with Blue Nile's Black Friday and Cyber Monday deals. Blue Nile offers an endless selection of bold gold styles, gemstone jewelry, and classic diamond pieces. And right now, Blue Nile is also offering 36-month special financing for a limited time on minimum purchases of $1,000. Restrictions apply. See BlueNile.com for details. That's BlueNile.com.